reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Where did you first read or hear of Adam Smith? <laughs> do, you, do you recall? I certainly read Adam Smith first in German. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Not very early in my studies. Well, I knew Adam Smith mainly through the history of economics lectures and so on. And it probably was very late that I read right through the Wealth of Nations. At first, the part on public finance on didn't interest me at all. I only came to appreciate the semi-political aspects of it very much later. And uh, being brought up <coughs> on the idea that the theory of value was central to economics, I didn't really fully appreciate him. <coughs> I think he's the one author where my appreciation has steadily grown and is still growing. For most, I think that's for most economists. Where, where did you get your formal education in economics, your first formal? Well, <coughs> in Wieser's lectures. Now, what were they like? Did he just come in and give a lecture? Or, or no, they were most impressive. He knew by heart his own book, so much so that we could follow his lecture <laughs> in the book and notice, I mean, how in the, he spoke an absolutely perfect German with very long periods so that we amused ourselves making note of all the subsidiary sentences where they could all, would get all the auxiliary verbs in the end <laughs> right, and he did. <laughs> And he did it equally perfectly when he inserted in his original text. Mm -hmm. Unless we followed it in writing, we would not know how he could remember this uh, very big book, The Theory of Social Economy, in that perfect form, and uh, occasionally pause with a certain trick. He had a golden hunting watch in a leather thing, and if he was in doubt about words, he would pull that out, spring it open, <laughs> look at it, close it, put it back, and continue his <laughs> I guess we puff on a pipe as an excuse <laughs> to do something like that. Uh, I th didn't you mention that, that Menger's book was more influential? Or am uh, I confused? Book, yes, a book which convinced me, it was before I went to Wieser's lectures. Oh, I see. Uh, it's very curious, the man who drew my attention to Menger's book was Ottmar Spann. A very, I don't know what name means anything to you, he was semi-crazy and changed violently from different political persuasions, from socialism to extreme nationalism to Catholicism, always a little a step ahead of current fashions. By the time he Nazis came into power, he was suspect as a Catholic, although five years before he was a leading extreme nationalist. But he uh, drew my attention to Menger's book at a very early stage, and Menger's Grundsätze probably more than any other book influenced me. Let me, is von Thunen, would he have been Fun available? Tuna, no, I came to know him very late. I didn't see him at all. Well, what were, uh, how large was Wieser's class? Uh, was it, say, 20 well, or 100? In the formal class to which he lectured, and which one knows is the kind of lectures, and particularly if the lecturer was His Excellency, the ex-minister, nobody would dare to ask a question or interrupt. We were just sitting, two or three hundreds of us, at the foot of this elevated uh, platform, was well, this very impressive figure, very handsome man in his early in his late sixties, with a beautiful beard, spoke these absolutely perfect <coughs> orations, and he had very little personal contact with his students, except when, as I did, 
one came up afterwards with an intelligent question. It once took a in personal interest in that individual. So he would have personal contacts with five or six out of the 300 who were sitting in his lectures. In addition, he attended one year his seminar. But that again was a very formal affair which somebody produced a long paper which was then commented upon by Wiesel. But personally, I ultimately became very friendly with him. He asked me many times to his house how far that was due, because he was a contemporary and friend of my grandfather. <laughs> oh, no, I don't know. Which occurs, uh, reminds me of the fact that you know, in Vienna, they well, I would have to <coughs> restrict it to non-Jewish intelligentsia was a very small circle where everybody knew everybody else. It so happened the other day that somebody was asking me about the famous people from Vienna from the period, beginning with Schrödinger, of course they knew him as a young man, and Frisch, the man on the bees, he was an old friend of my father, and so it went on all through the list, till it came to Freud. No, that was a different circle. I had never met him, and that it was a Jewish circle distinct from the non-Jewish one, and although I moved a good deal later <coughs> on the margin of the two groups, there was a sort of intermediate group, the purely Jewish circle in which Freud moves was a different world from ours. Mm -hmm. Were there any Jewish economists in, that, in, that, in the Jewish group there? Mises. I see. Oh, I didn't know that. I see. Mm -hmm. And with whom, of course, I was very close indeed. But, uh, well, it's not correct. Mises was not of the Jewish group, he was Jewish. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, he was rather regarded as a uh, monstrosity. A Jew who was neither a capitalist nor a socialist, uh, but an anti-socialist Jew who was not a capitalist was absolutely a monstrosity <laughs> in Vienna. <laughs> Any place. You know. uh, as a university student, or even shortly thereafter, what were the major topics of interest in economics? What are, were they technical <coughs> questions, or were they questions of socialism, or were they questions on um, inflation, or was there any dominant set of themes that... Uh, now, to me, you have to distinguish very sharply between two periods, before I went to America and after, when I still mm -hmm. retained my connection with the university. And the early period was very short. I did my degree in three years, I've mentioned before, with the mm -hmm. law, uh, with the veterans' privileges, so I did, in that period, before I went to America, not take part a great deal in discussion. Well, perhaps in the two years I was already with Mises between 21 and 23. Then the main interests were, on the one hand, pure value theory, and I was working on imputation, and Mises' idea on socialism. As I was starting for America, I had got bored with these two subjects, I still wrote up the article on imputation I had been uh, working on, but I turned in America to monetary theory, largely interested by the great discussions which were then carried on on Federal Reserve policy, on the idea that they had mastered the trade cycle, mm -hmm. uh, in constant contact with Hagot Beckhardt, who was writing his book on the uh, discount policies for the reserve mm -hmm. system. It was he who led me in all these discussions on the possibility of controlling the business cycle. And it was in America that my interest in monetary theories that started, for which I had the background of a strong influence of the Böhm-Bawerk tradition. I believe I also mentioned already, I didn't know Bern Babak as an economist personally, although he, like Wieser, his exact contemporary, were friends of my grandfather, and I actually saw him in the home of my grandfather before I knew what economics was. But in the Mises seminar, the shade of Bern Babak was dominating. He was the common base 
on which we talked and understood each other. And, uh, but even in his work, his uh, writings on marginal utility was perhaps more important than his working on interest. I think nearly everybody had some reservations on his interest theory because everybody accepted his article on marginal utility as the standard exposition really of the marginal utility theory. When I came back, I had changed in my interests from uh, value and the socialism to problems of capital, interest, money, and I was I had in fact in the United States started writing a thesis at New York University on the title "Is the Stabilization of the Value of Money Compatible with the Functions of Money?" I think you can still find in the files of New York University a registration for a doctor's degree on the subject. But when I came back, I was soon asked to write that missing volume to the great uh, encyclopedia of uh, the social sciences or economics, the Grundriss der Sozialökonomik, which was practically finished there, except that the authors who were to write the volume of money had died one after <laughs> another before supplying it. So I finally undertook it and didn't do it, because in the end, before I had done it, I went to London and at first had to interrupt working on it. And then before I returned to it, Hitler had come into power and the publisher came to visit me in London to ask me to be released from the contract because he could no longer publish a work of an author who had moved to England <laughs> in this German work. It was a great relief to me because my interests had moved other tasks to write while I was starting a professorship in London. A great treatise in German was uh, clearly impracticable. But it was in the work on that, uh, well, I say, one intermediate step. Out of my American thesis had grown a plan for what I believe intended to call investigations into monetary theory, of which again only one long article was ever written and published, that called the intertemporal equilibrium of prices and the changes in the value of money, I think, in the Weltwirtschaftliche Archiv, which I believe is probably the most characteristic product of my thinking of that period before I turned definitely to industrial fluctuations and the history of monetary theory, because it was really the history of monetary theory which is all I did for that intended textbook. I never started on the systematic part of it. And that was a stage in which I was invited to give... Oh, there's one other feature I ought to mention. <coughs> While I was in America, I got interested in the writings of Foster and Catchings. Mm -hmm. And there was then this competition for the best critique of Foster and Catchings, which I did not take part of. Afterwards, I regret it, because I thought the products were all so poor that I could have done better. <laughs> And when I had to give my formal lecture on, uh, for the acquiring position of Privatdozent, I chose a critique of Foster and Catchings on the title The Paradox of Saving uh, for that lecture and published it in German. And Lionel Robbins read that particular essay and that led him to invite me to give the lectures in London. And I drew in the lectures on what I'd done for my textbook on money, and of course the move to, well then I was asked by Robbins, I think even before was it when I was giving the lectures to do the review of Keynes' treatise. Mm -hmm. So I had a year or two which I invested in reviewing that thing, but again I had a curious outcome. The reason why I did not return to the charge when he published the uh, general theory, when I published the second part of my essay on Keynes, he 
his response was, well, never mind, I no longer believe that. <laughs> <laughs> the general theory? That was what Keynes yeah. told me about, yeah. volume, uh, uh, the second part of my yeah. review Quite of his. Yeah. I think very unjustly, because the second part of the treatise was probably the best thing Keynes volume ever did. Two. Yes, yes. Mm. Um, you mentioned that Robbins saw your uh, critique of Foster. Yes. Uh, uh, called the Paradox of Savings. Yes. And that's what called that's what caused called caused him you to invite me to give these lectures. I was going to inquire how come that he had heard about you or knew of you. Uh, but in Vienna, you worked with the reparations uh, group. No, no, it's not the reparations commission. The peace treaty, I believe, so, the same true of the German peace treaty, uh, made arrangements for the payment of private debts between the two countries, which got blocked by the outbreak of war. And uh, incidentally, the claims the Austrians had on the Allies would be credited to a reparation account. But that was only incidental aspect of it. The main thing was just clearing these debts which had been outstanding for five years with extremely complicated provisions because of the currency changes and so on. And uh, I got the job because I, the condition was to know law, some economics, and several languages. Mm -hmm. Now, by that time, I'd returned from America. I used to speak uh, French fairly well, which I've almost completely forgotten. And I knew even some Italian, which I picked up in the war. The three foreign languages, plus law, plus economics, qualified me for what was a comparatively very well-paid job well paid for in the government office because it was a temporary position. I was not a regular civil servant, but a temporary civil servant with a much higher salary than I would have had. Mm -hmm. So it was quite an attractive position, even if it hadn't been that Mises happened to become my official head. <laughs> That's where you met him? Or yes. You know? uh, <laughs> I believe again, I told the story already. Yes, he yeah. was sent to him by an introduction from Wiesel in which I was described as a promising young economist. And Wiese, Mises reading this promising young economist, I've never seen you at my lectures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we, st we are still the same. When you went to work in Vienna, did you carry a briefcase every day with your lunch in it to work and back? Uh, no, I was impressed. I how had, we had a sort of canteen I in the building, or in, no, in the ministry opposite. Mm -hmm. So I lunched there. Were you married then? Uh, not initially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I married while I was in this mm -hmm. When did you write that piece on rent control? And what was the uh, motivation? Well, the cause was simply that I was irritated by the fact that no economist had dealt with it. It seemed to me such a clear demonstration of what uh, price fixing, what effects it had. And that none of the local economists paid any attention to it, or rather no. There were a few of the social policy people who were all in favor of it, mm -hmm. who proved that they didn't understand any economics. When was this? What year do you recall? 27, 27, 27. Mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. In Vienna? In Vienna. Mm -hmm. It was a paper I read to our economic club. There had been an economic club who t which died during the inflation period, I don't know why, and I still had been as a guest at the meetings before it had uh, died. And then I more or less revived it, main purpose to bring Mises and Meyer together on the same uh, desk, because they were not very good relations, really. And that created some difficulty for us younger people. We had to be on good terms with <laughs> Maya in order to have any prospect at the university. We were more attracted by Mises. And so we revived this institution, which apart from the Mises seminar was the other occasion for general discussions of economics. And my one paper, the club, was the one on rent restriction, which then was published as a pamphlet in an enlarged form. Is that still uh, easily available? Do you know where? Not easily. Yes, yes, yes. It's uh, a partial translation is contained in a 
brochure on rent control or rent restrictions which the London Institute published, uh, but not a complete one. Do you have a complete set of your works? I have one, yes. Has it? And it has not been published as such or as a collected series, has it? No, no, they have not been reprinted. But there is, of course, a complete list of my publication in that Machlub yeah, volume. Yes, yes, yes. But a list is quite different from the... Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would you be uh, tolerant of a proposal to have the works all published and made available? Well, of course, everything in recent years, which is worth republishing, I have collected. Uh, but only what appeared in English, not the early things, are published in German. There aren't many, and they have some defects that have been oh, very closely looked, uh, carefully looked into. When there are things like that article on the intertemporal system of prices, the one on American uh, monetary policy, the one on imputation, I suppose yes, but both the translating and uh, some revision, for instance, I only discovered years later that in the article on American monetary policy, the printer ultimately mixed up the pages. <laughs> they don't occur in the proper sequence. Is it true that Mrs. Hayek has been doing, has been checking some of the translations? She did the some of the did. translating, and practically, I mean, uh, three of my books were essentially done by her. The, Counter-Revolution of Science, uh, one other of the early ones, and finally she practically redid the Constitution of Liberty. There was a complete translation which was unsatisfactory. Oh, you wrote that initially in German? Or no, no, I wrote it in English. In and it had been translated by somebody else, and that was very poor, and she redid oh, it. I see. Yeah. So we have your uh, monetary theory work in the United States, Rent control. Um, where did the capital theory interest come in? Or can you identify a place where you got involved in capital theory? Oh yes, I think it was essentially after prices and production that I couldn't elaborate this without elaborating capital theory. Okay. See, I was relying on it in its simple Bemberwerkian form and uh, very soon became aware that with the average period of production you didn't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it was planned as a two-volume work, one was static and one dynamic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took so long on the static part that uh, was finally glad of the excuse of the outbreak of war that bring out something which wasn't really finished, pretending that I never knew whether it would be published at all if I delayed, and without have, having even started on what I intended to be the second dynamic volume, well, I never did it. <laughs> now, you're referring to pure theory of capital? The pure theory of yeah, capital is the first part of what was intended to be a two-volume work. I see, yeah. The pure theory of capital and the dynamics of capital. Now, again, I've looked at that lately. And my thought was that had Fisher not written his theory of interest book with the words, the algebra, and the arithmetic to illustrate right. it, that your book would probably been better known and more widely used. Do you have any conjectures to yeah. whether that? Well, the capital theory is a, an extraordinary, uh, what should I call it? I uh, forget there is a good English word for it a thing which refuses simple treatment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there was another very important book in the Vixelian tra tradition by a man called Ockerman. Yes. Which is really very important, but nobody understands it <laughs> because it's so complex and difficult. And I think the same is very largely true of my book. It's become too difficult but the subject mm -hmm. is too difficult. Mm -hmm. When Friedrich Lutz, for instance, told me one day, well, after he found the things himself, he finds he has, I have already said them. Because he, he had his book on that. And he never learned it from my book, but he had to work it out himself. In that pure theory of capital, I was taken by the similarity between your position and that of Joan Robinson and um, 
Pasinetti and the others at the current English Cambridge School who are objecting to Samuelson's simple model, I shouldn't call you Samuelson, the classical simple homogeneous model. I don't want to associate you with that Cambridge School, but nevertheless, there is a similarity. I've been told so before, particularly by Lachman, who carefully followed this discussion. Mm -hmm. I haven't followed it. Mm -hmm. Well, you might find it entertaining because as uh, uh, Joan Robson is saying, you cannot use a simple concept of capital uh -huh. and understand capital theory. Uh -huh. And there's been a big debate on that. And I, uh -huh. my only impression is that they are quite right. But when I read your work, or even the work of Fisher, I often wonder why anybody, why anybody thought that Well, I've no doubt you are right mm -hmm. because, as I say, Lachman, who probably knows no, my no. work better than almost anybody else, has told me the same thing. Mm -hmm. but since they came out, I never could have returned to that interest. And uh, why not? <laughs> if, if, or do you know why not? Well, I've become much too interested in the semi-philosophical uh, policy problems, the interaction between economics and uh, political structure. Those are more difficult problems. <laughs> they are in a way more difficult and of course much more difficult to come to clear conclusions, but I've been engaged in them so long. You know, it was a route to serfdom which led me to the Constitution of Liberty. Having done the Constitution of Liberty, I found that I had only restated in modern language what had been the classical uh, liberal view, but discovered there were at least three issues which I hadn't answered systematically. I cannot now enumerate them and come back to me in a moment. So I felt I had to fill the gaps and I believe that in a way the thing on which I've now been for 17 years, which I've now at last finished, law, legislation and liberty, is probably a much more original contribution to the thing. It's not merely a restatement, but I have developed my own views on several issues, on the whole relation between the rule and order, on uh, uh, democracy and uh, my critique of the social uh, justice concept, which were absolutely essential as complements of the original thing, answering questions which traditional liberalism had not answered. But that was such a big and long, I mean, I never imagined in either case. Well, in fact, the Constitution of Liberty I did relatively quickly. I wrote to three parts in three successive years and then took a fourth year to rewrite the whole thing. So I must have done the Constitution of Liberty in four years, while, of course, with an interruption for health reasons on uh, law, legislation and liberty. Well, we have 78 now. Yes, since I formed the conception, I didn't immediately start working on it, it's 17 years. I was going to ask, do you have a work schedule during the day? Do you, uh, in the morning, do work? To Rewriting? It has changed in the course of time a great deal. I mean, I most, uh, most of my life I could work both all morning and again in the evening. Now the evening is out now for any original work. I can only read in the evening. And even my, my steam lasts uh, for two hours in the morning or something like that. Mm -hmm. I usually, if I am not disturbed, I as soon as I've read my newspaper, I sit down to work and work for two hours. And sometimes a cup of coffee helps me on a little longer, but not very much longer. When you're working, are you at a desk writing, or do you pace and think, or...? In or an easy chair, leaning back and writing <laughs> on my knees. I see. Well, that's a nice, comfortable way. <laughs> you don't go to sleep off and suddenly fall, you yeah. wake up five minutes yeah, later. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, if I try to do it in the afternoon, it happens to me. <laughs> Uh, I should say I have my reading periods and my writing periods. When I really want to read extensively, I cannot write at the same time. You mean during the same week or so, or I mean the same day, or? Well, sometimes it's a question of two or three months that I do only work. reading, and oh, practically, I well, I'm making notes all the time, mm -hmm. but I don't attempt to pursue systematically a trend of thought. While uh, once I settle down to writing, I consult books, but I no longer read systematically, at least on the subject. In the evening, I'll be reading something else, but... In general, for many of your articles, when you've written them, did you 
foresee when you started what you were going to say or did you take a topic and then work and work and pretty soon out came a finished product which was entirely different than what you even thought you were going to be saying? Uh, mostly the latter. Mm -hmm. There are very few short pieces which I saw clearly beforehand could write out at once. Mm -hmm. But the novel, of course, is one which I already described, collecting notes on cards, mm -hmm. rearranging them in a systematic order, writing it out in longhand in a systematic order. Mm -hmm. So, and in very few exceptional cases, I just sat down and wrote an article. Well, let me just make one, this occurs my mind. If you could have one of your articles or books destroyed because you wish you had never published it, is there any such, is there any such paper? It was a waste of time and you should have never written it? I think things which I published prematurely. Mm -hmm. For instance, that the article, that early one, on the intertemporal system of prices, which I believe contained some important ideas, was clearly prematurely published. I didn't see the things yet and they write the thing. It would have been wiser not to publish it at that mm -hmm. time. Or they probably would have meant that they never published these ideas yeah. at all. They exist only in an imperfect form. Or uh, others. Mm. Well, I would have to think of those which I have not republished, which <laughs> I have probably forgotten. <laughs> those which I have okay. republished. Well, uh, if you remember what they are, we'll know which ones they should have been. <laughs> but, you know. Was there pressure, as there is now, so-called publisher parish, in, in the 20s, that there was a publication matter of getting yourself acquainted with other people, letting them know what you were doing, mode of communication rather than establishing a prestige? Well, of course, uh, it was, in a sense, very strong in Austria for getting the Privatdozentur. Mm -hmm. We had to publish, relatively early, a major piece of work. Mm -hmm. It was not a question of number of articles. It had to be one substantial work. But that's the only thing corresponding to the publisher parish, which I experienced, but partly, of course, because I was extremely fortunate getting the age of 32 as good a professorship as I ever could hope to get. Yeah. I mean, if you are a 32 professor at the London School of Economics, you don't have any further ambitions. <laughs> <laughs> as Alice Smith said, yes, <laughs> you're well established. There was an episode in, uh, in which I first, when I first heard your works, the two, the price production and the, uh, let me call it debate or discussion with Knight over the pure theory of capital. Uh, do you have any memories of that or uh, stories you might tell us? No, it was really a very distant affair. I had known Knight slightly. He had been on a visit to Vienna in the twenties, but I didn't know him at all well. And all the discussions in which I got involved, except Keynes, whom I knew fairly well, were really was a distant target of a person who was not a live figure to me. Mm -hmm. uh, he, Pigou, whom also came to know later quite well, was still another one I got engaged in, or one or two Germans, Pali and others. Uh, no, they both were discussions with a distant figure and were not really continued as discussions. I, commented upon their work once and left it at that. They were very hard articles to read. Mm -hmm. The one by Knight mm -hmm. difficult. In fact, Knight's, I guess, attitude that uh, capital was just a big yeah. homogeneous mass. Uh, I never understood mm -hmm. in yeah, what sense it was a mass at yeah. all. I mean, it, it was not a magnitude in any sense. Yeah, was, in fact, there was a famous, famous, the theory of bombing during the war when mm -hmm. there were some of the uh, bombing experts said, let us pick certain <coughs> topics and destroy specific capital. Mm -hmm. And the Nidians said, oh no, all capitalists in time is substitutable. Bomb anything, you're bombing capital. So just go out and dump some bombs on Germany, any old place. <laughs> That's gonna have, that was like known as the capital, the Nidian theory of bombs. You know? now, of course, Knight was a very puzzling figure. I mean, yes, a man indeed. of such intelligence. Mm -hmm and capable of going so wrong on particular points. For the moment, you know, a year later he would see it. Yeah. But he got uh, committed to a particular thing and pursued it to its bitter end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was wrong. Well, to someone like me who had known of your works in price and production, pure theory of capital, finding the road to serfdom suddenly in the, 
after the war was a jolt. I said to myself, well, what's, what does he know about? What's he doing right on a subject like this? But if one knows your history, it's not at all surprising. But at that time, it was, it was a very surprising event to me to see that book come out. You knew it, uh, when I started in uh, 39 on these articles on the counter-revolution of science, this was the beginning of a plan of write a major book called The Abuse and Decline of Reason, where what I published is the beginning of the study of the abuse of reason, what I now call the constructivist approach, and the decline of reason was something of which ultimately they wrote to serve them become a adva popular advanced sketch. So I had the whole idea in my mind when external circumstances of environment made it necessary for me to explain to my English colleagues that they were wrong in their interpretation of the Hitler movement, uh, particularly Lord uh, Sir William Beveridge as he was then, who was incredibly naive on all these things who firmly believed that the bad German capitalists had started a reaction against the promising socialist developments. So I wrote out my basic idea, a memorandum to him, and expanded it into an article. And then uh, Gideons here asked me to supply it, uh, enlarged into a pamphlet. And then I just had plenty of time during the war. You see, I was in that fortunate position of being already a British subject, so not being molested, but being an ex-enemy, therefore not being drawn into any war job, mm -hmm. and having practically no students for the war period. So I had plenty of time. And so after I'd finished the uh, uh, pure theory of capital, I was uh, not having any other plans, so I gradually enlarged this pamphlet into a book in which I was restricted only by the fact that the Russians were then our allies, so I had to tame down what I said about communism and uh, made it perhaps overemphasized the totalitarian developments of the Nazi kind and not saying much about it. But it was an outcome of uh, a fairly long period of development of my thinking. But still at that time I thought it was a pamphlet for the time, for a very specific purpose, persuading my English, uh, what you would call liberals, I mean uh, Fabians, that they were wrong, that it caught on in the America was a complete surprise to me. I never thought the Americans would be the least interested in that book. Yet if one looks back at your earlier work on, so, like your earlier thinking on socialism mm -hmm. when you were in the Vienna area, and your collectivist economic planning mm -hmm. essays, it isn't surprising if one knows that, but you know, the planning I didn't know that. book had a curious effect on my thinking because I'm told there's even a paragraph or two in that essay. It was the thinking on the planning problem which drew my interest to the methodological problems, to the whole problem of the philosophical approach to the social sciences. It was quite unexpected when I first intended to publish merely a collection of translations of the things which remained un unknown in the English literature. Then I was told that I had to write an explanation of the environment in which a discussion had taken place. Then there was some discussion beginning about the problem, so I wrote a concluding essay dealing with the recent literature. But that was all very much <coughs> unplanned and unintended, although it had its effects on my further thinking doing it. Did you ever know Thomas Nixon Carver? I visited him yes, once. Yes. I see on my first visit to America, I it was one of the letters of introduction from Schumpeter, mm -hmm. and uh, I did during this uh, 15 months in America travel as far as Boston to the north, Washington to the south, and Bear Mountain to the west. Yeah, that covers it. <laughs> <laughs> and <coughs> in uh, Harvard. 
I delivered my letters to Tausig and Carver, mm -hmm. and made the acquaintance of both a gentleman. Carver took me to his country club and gave me the regular luncheon which I always <laughs> produced. <laughs> and <coughs> all I remember that he was frightfully offended that I, he and John Hobson in England had published books under the similar name, something about distribution, I forget what it was. Mm -hmm. And my mentioning his book and Hobson's in one sentence greatly offended him. <laughs> when I first went to UCLA, he walked into my office and asked if Anderson was present. I said, no, who shall I say came? He said, tell him Carver was here. And I thought, well, there was a famous Carver, but it wouldn't be you. As he left, I thought to myself, he's dead many years ago. But he lived oh, past 90. I and in Santa Barbara or That's way, in the Santa right. Monica. And he Monica. and his wife celebrated their 75th wedding anniversary. Which mm -hmm. I, there we go. Uh, two things you wrote, again, like, you know, I'm thinking my own personal influence on me uh, after your price production, was the uh, uh, individualism and economic order and the use of knowledge in society, yes. which I would regard as your two best articles. Best in terms yes, of uh, interest of having Well, individualism, uh, the use of knowledge in society, or no, the earlier one really, economics and knowledge, That's the 37 right. one, right. which is reprinted in the volume, on the, uh, that is the, the one time. which marks the new look at things yes. in my way. It was new for you <coughs> too then, was it sort of a... Uh, Hmm? You s it was a new to you too, was it? Was it a change in your own thinking? Uh, yes, it I was see. really the beginning of my looking things in a new light. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you ask me, I would say that uh, up till that moment, I was developing conventional ideas. And it was the 37 lectures to the Economic Club in London, my presidential address, which is uh, Economics and Knowledge, which started my own way of thinking. Sometimes in private I say I've made one invention, uh, one discovery and two inventions in, in social sciences. The discovery is the approach of the utilization of dispersed knowledge, a short formula which I use for it. And the two inventions I've made are denationalization of money and uh, my system of democracy. <laughs> I mean, uh, the first will live. <laughs> How did you have to get into that topic? When you had to give this lecture, something must have made you start thinking that oh, way. Oh, it was a... Several ideas converging on that uh, subject. It was, we just discussed, my essays on socialism. The use in my trade cycle theory of the prices as guides to production. The current discussion of anticipation, particularly in the discussion with the Swedes on the subject, mm -hmm. to some extent perhaps nice risk, uncertainty and profit, which contains certain suggestions in that direction, all that came together. And uh, it was with the feeling of a certain illumination, certain enlightenment that I I wrote that lecture in a certain excitement. Well, I was aware did. that uh, I was putting things which were fairly well known in a new form. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps it was the most exciting moment in my career when I saw it. In oh, I'm way. delighted to hear you say that because I had that copy typed up to oh. mimeograph to my students, the first mm -hmm. course I gave here. And Alan Wallace, who I guess you must oh, know, yes, uh, came through town one oh. day and I said, Alan, I've got a great article. He said, he looked at it, he started to laugh. He says, I've seen it too and it's just phenomenal. Uh, and I would have, I'm just delighted to hear you say that, that it was exciting because it was mm -hmm. to me too. But when did the idea hit you? When you started to write this paper, started thinking about it, there must be some moment at which you could suddenly see you had something here. Was there such a moment? Or that you suddenly said, gee, I've got a good paper going here. It must have been in the few months preceding that, because I knew I was very unhappy about having to give the presidential <laughs> address to the economic club. Mm -hmm. And then I hit on that subject and wrote it out for that purpose. How long exactly before the date it was, I couldn't say now. 
But I do know that the, the idea of uh, articulating things which had been vaguely in my mind in this form must have occurred to me when I was thinking of a subject for that lecture as presidential address in the London Economic Club. Well, that was a uh, very influential article, I uh. must say. How are we fixed on time? Do you have about any? Five about five minutes, thank you. Um, well, let's take it. Well, there's the Ricardo effect in which you've done some work. Yes. Do you have any recollections about getting into that? Well, I guess I should go back and say one thing. Go back on this bit about use of knowledge and uh, individual. I would have conjectured your rent control article and might have had some uh, carry through on that. that uh, if one perceives that, he can begin to see this issue. Well, I was uh, recently surprised how much I had forgotten about that article. I hardly knew any longer that it existed, and it must have played a very important role in my actual thinking. But I find it very difficult to recall now exactly what role it played. It somehow fitted in with my concern with the direction of investment mm -hmm. and the role which prices and interest rates played in uh, governing the direction of investment. But I cannot at the moment, I, maybe that next time when we talk, this has come back, it usually happens that sure. uh, my mind happens to uh, in my memory is now a slow process. I usually remember things a little later than I wish I would. <laughs> at least remember. you remember them. Some of you don't remember at all. It'd be interesting to get that article and look at it and compare it with the one by uh, Stigler and Friedman yes. on the same subject and see what similarities there oh, are. Oh, they are very similar yeah, indeed. If I'm see. not mistaken, they are both reprinted in the pamphlet of the London Institute. Uh, okay. The IEA? Yes. Oh, I see. No, I'll, I'll check. I'm a trustee of that board. I should know <laughs> what, what they're doing. Let me then return for a couple of minutes to that Ricardo effect, uh, which again came through, I guess, in the uh, capital value theory. Uh, yes. So uh, that was the main result of uh, trying to provide a foundation for prices and production in elaborating the theory of capital. And was certainly in the course of working on the pure theory of capital that uh, I became aware of this fact that uh, the price of labor really very largely determined the form of investment. That the more expensive labor was, the more capital intensive you made, made production. And then I think it was a pretty sudden event that said, oh, this is the same thing which I've been arguing in prices of production in a slightly different form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the curious thing is that so many people did not see that it was the same argument same in a different form. Yeah. I think they're discovering it now. Yeah. Even the re-switching theory that you're coming out, that's yeah. coming out of the Cambridge School on the connection between interest rates and the so-called ratio labor to capital is essentially no, the same. I've just published an article in the London Times on the effect of trade unions generally. It contains a short paragraph just pointing out that one of the effects of a high wages leading to unemployment and it forces capitalists to use their capital in a form when they will employ little labor. I now see from the reaction that it's still a completely new <laughs> argument to most of people. The old are, they're all arguments, even the trade bills doctrine in the, in the, in the uh, bullion currency days is still is new. In a couple of minutes we have left. You received a gold bar of yes. which I was happy to be one of the donors in the Montpellier meeting in yes. You still have it? Oh, sure. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, sure. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to sit on this. <laughs> well, I have several gold what was it? How many ounces was it? Do you remember? No, I don't remember it's the ounces. I can tell was. you exactly oh, how large it was. It was a nice big one. I got <laughs> to touch it and hold it. Was. <laughs> it was a we were very smart to make that investment <laughs> for you. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I have a Kruger Rand. I have a genuine Ducat. I have a genuine Sol. Ducat. Ducat. The Italian order. Which was a little trade coin for all through the last century, and I was sovereign. <laughs> now you collect snuff boxes, I believe. But do you well, I've been given snuff boxes by various see. people. Well, uh, do you have anything that you collect, like like money? I, I really mean no, no, coins. No, or no, you have no, no uh, collection. Nothing since my boyhood. I used to a stamp collector, inevitably in uh, my 
Well, really, we are early. Mm -hmm. well, in a way, I was, of course, brought up as a collector of flowers, insects, minerals, and so on. I mean, in my boyhood, I had a collection of all these. My introduction to biology and the natural science was very largely via collecting. I see. And my father had the greatest private herbarium of any botanist in the world at that time, and our apartment was eating up, was being eaten up by <laughs> uh, places to keep all his uh, flowers, his herbarium, which was finally acquired by the University of Lund. And still there. you had daily duties every day to go in and water and do things that you little disliked? Oh, his dry pressed flowers, no watering, no, it, the only thing was a special box, watertight, in which they were fumigated mm -hmm. in order to keep the insects out of the thing. Mm -hmm. That was a regular process in which I assisted with, what was it, a frightfully stinking uh, substance which they put in. Uh, not hydrogen, no, that would be. Not yeah. I think our time is about gone, <laughs> we're not signaling things, but uh, we stopped on a very interesting topic. My first attempt at scientific writing was, in fact, to identify one species of orchid, uh, which I gave up ultimately because I never could get a live specimen of it. I'm now pretty sure it was merely a variety which somebody had classified as a different species. How did he keep his herbarium warm during the winter? Was it uh, oh, and, uh, just, uh, just glass cover? Was, uh, it was interior, I think. 